bit tech from a total twisty a live stream again Hungian Matsotsotso. Maulik, Maulik. All right, half a day, half a day, Toro Samsuni, Ume Ega Purume Ekunguk, Inanhusi Michael Luhan Bavakwa. I am the host of Fanatsu for this episode. And um, for those of you who are interested in Chamorro cultural politics, Chamorro history, Chamorro identity, this is a very, this will be a very interesting sort of episode, a very important deep dive into one of the moments which is pretty watershed in terms of thinking about our recent history in terms of something which today is very commonplace, the Chamor Renaissance, the cultural renaissance, and sort of how that gets started. And it's also, it's always important for those of us who study history to remember that things change, but then oftentimes people kind of, most people don't recognize that things have changed they just kind of flow with those changes and so we can see that for nowadays if you said you wanted to do a, a play in which you talked about the tomorrow spirit in which you talked about the tomorrow identity and celebrated the tomorrow people everyone would say yeah there's like a bunch of those you know of course do that put a board yeah sure can my kids join your dance group <laughs> but if we go back a few decades something like that was fairly unheard of Something like that was very uncommon. And as our guest today will talk about, if we go back just a few decades, there was regular debates in the community within Chamorros themselves about whether Chamorros even exist anymore. And so that's why I'm very glad to have with me for today's episode of Finatsu, uh, Dr. Robert Underwood, former member of Congress, former UOG professor, uh, UOG uh, president and professor, but always sort of a a writer, a scholar, an activist, um, and so many other things. And in addition, he is also a playwright. He wrote the play, <laughs> the script for the play, Guahu Tautotano, which we are going to be talking about today. And so uh, before before we begin, though, Senor Putfobot, can you take us back to kind of the the climate in the in the early '80s when Guahu Tautotano, this performance that meant that that was meant to show sort of the the continuum of Chamorro history and existence across thousands of years, um, and be performed at Festpack and so on. And so, can you take us back though to sort of the '80s and and what issues of identity and culture were like uh, back then? Uh, yeah, well, Sidus Masi Miguel, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Todo tempo, put favor. I appreciate uh, very much uh, your uh, kindness in trying to and your diligence in trying to raise this issue. Uh, it's important to understand, I think that that's, this was uh, almost 40 years ago, the production of this play. Uh, it's important to understand that growing up in the 60s and in the 70s and before then, the idea that the Chamorros were a continuing people all the way back to the original people who came here uh, about 2000 years BC, maybe 1500, 2000 years BC, where one continuous group was uh, was seen as uh, inaccurate and not reflective of the actual history of uh, the Chamorro people. So uh, there was, a, 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 you know, like um, if you read uh, the standard history text uh, by uh, Paul Carano, uh, he said that the, uh, the ancient Chamorros are the remote ancestors of the present day Guamanians. And he used the term Guamanian to make that distinction. We were Guamanians now, whatever that meant, which for most Chamorros meant just, we were Chamorros, Guamanian was meant Chamorro. But uh, the, the idea that Guamanian was a more accurate historical cultural term uh, than the, the word Chamorro was very uh, uh, prominent. And so that whole idea I used to, I gave a lecture on it one time and I called it the Chamorro affirmation and the Chamorro denial point of view. And that was an avid conversation, not between Chamorros and non-Chamorros, but amongst Chamorros, as you just articulated. That was an, a strong conversation. Did Chamorros really exist uh, anymore? 
Uh, are they so remote? Are we so different? Or are we uh, such a kind of like a boonie dog uh, bred breed of people that, uh, you know, nobody can ever legitimately claim to be uh, tomorrow. And so a lot of that uh, application of that idea came through uh, repeatedly. And every time you uh, articulated for something tomorrow, this would be raised as a way to delegitimize or delimit what your effort was. And so into that, I, I have to credit uh, the work for this, uh, Guajo Tototano, really belongs to Carlos Taitano. And so uh, it's important, under, um, his uncle Carlos, he's my mother's first cousin, but it's really important to understand who Carlos Taitano was in this uh, context. Carlos Taitano was a young Chamorro man who went to the Hawaii before World War II to go to school. And in that, he lived with his relatives who were really uh, Titanos. There were these Titano relatives um, who kind of came from the Titano uh, 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 perspective, the, the Titano Protestant tradition. And so Uncle Carlos said what he noticed about those, those uh, relatives is that they all basically intermarried with Hawaiians, and they all sort of saw themselves as Hawaiians more than Chamorros. And then he started to understand that their view of being Hawaiian uh, was really grounded in their indigenous identity. And he said, well, that's, that's, that's what Chamorros were. So he, re he didn't like the term Chamorro. He would say, you know, antes man mafanane Chamorro, antes tototono. And that's why he was so uh, strong about that. And so he and I, of course, I've known him for uh, many years, and he was my. Um, uh, when I was elected to the first youth Guam legislature, he was the, the speaker of the real Guam legislature at the time. And he was in the kind of political opposite end. But, you know, he and I had always been, uh, he, uh, I think over time he, he, he sought me out for this particular project because I had some moral language skills that uh, a lot of people didn't have. And I also had some Spanish language skills that a lot of people didn't have. And so he said, well, you know, you can tell the difference instantly. What, what words are Spanish in origin? And, and so your, your task is to help write this script or write the script and then help write some chants and kind of, uh, you know, take out uh, Spanish words. So that's, that's what he asked me to do. And that's what I did. And so... You know, his whole objective was always to 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 reinforce that connection, to show continuity, and and it was a tough job, you know, because people people felt like, oh, you know, we're more we're more civilized than that. We're not we're not savages, you know. That there was, and it, it, it's reflected in the in this common thing I hear, and we still hear it to this day. Uh, a Chamorro goes to the States and he, and someone asks him, does he live in a grass hut? And he says, no, hell no, we don't live in grass hut. Like, why are you getting mad about that? What difference does that make? It's like the whole notion is that you're, you think you're taking offense at people thinking that you're an indigenous person. Why are you taking offense at that? And mm. that, that, that kind of psychology is, the, oh, you know how to speak English. Well, what do you mean? Of course we know how to speak English. As if... <laughs> as if these were like badges of honor and progress. Uh, and so, you know, you, when, you, when you hear people say that, like, what are you, what, who are you comparing yourself to? Why is there not that continuity? So I'm just grateful that uh, Uncle Carlos came along. I'm so grateful for that uh, kind of uh, nonconformist, recalcitrant uh, perspective that... Uh, some moral Protestants gave to everything, <laughs> which is my mother <laughs> and, and Uncle Carlos and, and that whole gang of people there that just said, yeah, that's the way it is. But you know what? We're, we're something a little bit different. And also, even, even my own father was uh, very strongly, uh, you know, it, he, he would, when we were growing up, he said, if there was a war between uh, Chamorros and Americans, of course we're going to take the Chamorro side. You know, and <laughs> if there was a war again with the Spaniards, of course we're going to, you know, and mm. in spite of all the things that were so, it, I was kind of reared in that tradition, but but um, Uncle Carlos was uh, brought it to mm. life. 
No, thank you. Because I thank you for sharing that. And then I love I love that a uh, critical titano equetunai the sort of the the critical titano uh, analysis that 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 so frequently comes out from that clan. Um, yeah. But I, one thing that you're touching on there, which uh, I think it's important for us to document, is that amongst sort of the the generation of leaders that emerge after World War II, you have some very critical souls. You know, you have some who are not per- particularly critical, but they may still have buildings named for them or things named for them. But then you have those who really saw things very differently. And one of the things that you're pointing out there, there was somebody like Carlos Titano or even his contemporary, although a little bit younger than him, uh, Paul Berdalio, sort of were two men who really saw that Chamorros should embrace their indigeneity. And that was not something that, as you as you mentioned, sort of the remnants of his kind of that colonial imprinting in which you're just supposed to kind of, if you're recognized as anything other than this, then you're supposed to get really upset and offended that how oh, that you're I'm not I'm not like that oh my goodness how could you dare see me like that but okay. what we see with uh, Berdalio and others and even to some extent although he was a little less forward about it you know somebody like Tony Palomo uh, just embracing this indigenous and so can you speak to that a little bit because you said some of it but then in the in the yeah. 70s and in the 80s and this play represents kind of a moment in which the larger community is kind of asked to recognize that possibility. And so can that, you speak to that for both? Yeah, so, so and of course, you want to add to that. You, know, you also want to add to that uh, F.B. Leon Guerrero. You also want to add to that uh, Richard Titano, another Cueto. And so yeah, that, 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 uh, those, those individuals uh, uh, saw Guam as a unique place standing on its own. And so the question of the connection to it its Chamorro roots was, whereas it usually was framed like we're embarrassed about it, we're so glad we're not those people anymore, uh, we're so glad we're modern. So when you um, look in the 50s and in the 60s, when you look at ads in the newspaper or you look at portrayals of Guam, people emphasize the similarities. Oh, the, the Guamanians, the modern day Guamanians, they're just like Americans. They love hot dogs. They uh, play baseball. Uh, They have women's clubs. They they do things that Americans do. So that 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 cultural description and the social description went along that line. Then something went awry in the '60s, and then you had you know one of the things that went awry, of course, was the '60s was a, a great time for worldwide re-examination of, uh, of, of Western culture and civilization, but also in the context of, of Guam, is you had the first uh, post-war generation coming to maturity. Of course, I'm part of that, and you know, many, many others are part of that. And so we had this kind of innate sense that uh, you know, something's not quite right here, and, and we were looking for people to, to provide leadership on that. And and Tony Palomo was one, you know, he he wrote those things in Pacific Profile. I'm just amazed that people don't understand what he had a great impact on on the way I saw Guam. And it was in a subtle way. And uh, and uh, and Uncle Richard and Uncle Carlos and and uh, and Paul Bordalio as well. And so all of those individuals. But really, there was something that was, you know, uh, amongst uh, the younger generation that was defiant. Like, why are we spending all our time uh, uh, trying to pretend that we're something that we're not? Why are we rewarding people for being something that they're not? Why don't we reward people for something that we are? And why don't we look like, look at that introspectively? So when Uncle Carlos uh, fashioned this and he said, "How? what is the device that we want to use in order to... Uh, bring this uh, Toto Tano to life. So we, I think he did, and I certainly did. I had an innate belief that Chamorros understood who they were. They just didn't have the chance yet to express it. So when the young boy comes home from school and he tells his grandmother, who the first one was uh, Mrs. Huffer, then instead Huffer in the play, you know, my teachers are saying that all the Chamorros are dead and gone. 
What does that mean? That all the tomorrows are dead, and this was very common uh, in, in the 60s and 70s. And so when Mrs. Huffer said, told her the young boy to pick up the shell and listen to it, and you can hear your ancestors. And when, she, when he, he picked it, and that was a device, because I had to think hard about what kind of device am I going to bring this back? So she, listen to it, and boom, then you were introduced to a whole new world of Tautotano. And when that whole exercise, a lot of arguments, what is a Tautotano dance, what is in all these back and forth, much of which I was present at, much of which I wasn't present at in, in preparing for the argument. How do you sing? How do you perform? And you had a bunch of dancers and performers who were good dancers, good performers. And you had, of course, the talent of uh, Johnny Sablan and, and uh, Flora uh, Kwan. So you had that talent. And when all of that came to surface and it came out, and of course, the irony is that the real choreographer behind this is Ben Gidiola, uh, you know, who's a, a great, <laughs> I think he's a great choreographer. Some of the dancers that uh, he, uh, you know, engineered are mercifully not with us anymore. I remember one where people were dancing around like they were riding in a canoe. I thought, well, that was kind of cute, but it didn't, uh, didn't work out. But there are other things. But, but Benji, Benji was great because he knew how to use that talent and he, he used that imagination. So then when, when all of that dancing was occurring and then the moment came that the Europeans arrived and boom, it's just like they came. Ah, and here they came and uh, the stage went dark, few things, and then the lights opened up it was intermission, and people were crying. And so when people cried, when I saw that, and I saw that, I said, you know, that means that there was something intuitive in people all along. They knew who they were, and they just wanted a chance to see who they were. Not who they are in 1984 Guam, but who they are as a long uh, a tradition. Uh, lots of twists and turns, lots of different ideas, but who they who they were, and when you when you saw people cry, then you understood that uh, wow, this really uh, tapped into something, mm -hmm. and so uh, that was the, that was the moment that uh, I knew. Of course, there were people who came up to me after the play and said, "How come you didn't pick me as singer, or how come uh, you didn't invite me to do the dancing?" I said, "Hey, I'm just the script writer." <laughs> I'm just a piano player here. I don't know what's <laughs> going on. <laughs> I'm not in charge. I'm, I'm just a young kid. <laughs> I'm just a piano player here. And, uh, but, but once, once that got, you, you could see that it tapped into something. And it woke up something in everybody. It woke up something in Frank Rabon. It woke up something in Johnny Sablon. It woke up something in Flora Bassa. It woke something up in everybody. It touched people in a way that, they kind of wanted to do, but now they did it. Then, you know, we brought in people. People started to say Guahu Tototono, and, and Jesse Rivera went on that. And, you know, and then people started chanting, and then people became, uh, you know, uh, stronger and stronger and more imaginative. And, uh, you know, and it's okay. It's all right. It's not, you know. We weren't uh, tapping into the Holy Grail. We were tapping into a, an inbred sentiment. You know, that's that's the the thing about it is that you are you're tapping into some memory and some encoding of identity that was there, clearly there, wasn't invented. We didn't con people into believing this. We just gave them the idea. Like, think about this, and they. They looked at it and they cried. They cried. They cried for their people. Mm. And they cried for their people in a way that they never cried before. That's the that's the moment that you know you that they were touched. Mm. No, it and it's interesting because from from today's perspective, of course, these things are are much more common. 
not amongst yeah. everybody, but it's common. I mean, um, you know, we had a we had a language immersion camp for adults at the museum and there was crying amongst the students every single day as they kind of reached, you know, reconnected to their language and their identity, but sort of going back, you know, to the 1980s, <laughs> imagining sort of a, like a, a group of people in sort of a, a theater hall kind of feeling that at naval of, station. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. At Naval station, feeling that whole of emotion that you just described, which as you said, you know, it, it didn't come, it didn't, you know, it wasn't a magic show. It didn't come out of nowhere. It was connected to something that was in them, whether it was in simply like, a, and, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, that's the continuity of identity is that even if you don't say, even if you are not exactly like this anymore, there's still these ways that you are connected to it. And sometimes you might de-emphasize it, you know, sometimes you might not recognize it, but it's there, you know, and and what what you described and, you know, uh, what I've heard you talk about sometimes is that the language, the language is one of those ways that even if you, if you speak Chamorro, people have probably spoken Chamorro here for thousands of years. And even if you, you might speak Chamorro with a, like, like my kids with a Valley Girl accent, or you might speak Chamorro like I do with like a second language learner, very Americanized California accent, or if you speak tomorrow like you are an all-star Tetsa, the words that you say, and even maybe even the tune of it is something that has deeper roots, has deeper roots. And so uh, I think uh, it's uh, even just hearing you describe, because I imagine there were some people in there in the crowd at, at Naval Station where you were incredibly surprised sort of to see them pulled. I mean, right. I imagine... <laughs> Some political leaders who were there who yeah, yeah, were crying <laughs> they were crying and and uh, so and and you're so right about the language it's always like that's kind of like a magic potion to say to people mago minago lalolo matakna man these words have been around for thousands of years and then when you say them you're, you're tapping into something that has been said for thousands of years by a group of people that you belong to. What is the magic in that? That's the magic. That, that opens up the doors. So, you know, as always, I, I, I to chide some people, I'd rather you spend more time learning about Minago and, uh, than uh, wearing a shinahi. Not that wearing a shinahi is a bad idea, Miguel, but I'm just saying that Wearing a sinahi, there you go, a handsome model for it, is not enough. It's just not enough. It's an accoutrement. And, and so now you get to the nub of it. But to understand that perspective at the time, you know, there's uh, two, two things that occur to me. Uh, one is when you go back to um, Safford's book, uh, and he talks about life at the turn of the century, and he's asking this young Chamorro girl, why doesn't she wear flowers in her hair? And her response was, what do you think I am, a Carolinian? <laughs> you know, so, so that notion of like, what is progress and what is cultural sophistication? Those Chamorro women who are all good Chamorro speakers, you know, uh, wouldn't be caught dead wearing flowers in their hair. Uh, they just wouldn't, you know. Um, uh, you know, it's maybe it's just a temporary pause in a long history, but it's important to understand that. The other thing was I used to, when I was teaching at GW, and, and I would ask students to write essays, and they would write, you know, the Guamanian people this, the Guamanian, and then I would cross out Guamanian, and I'd put Chamorro, and then I'd tell them, if you mean Chamorro, say Chamorro, Guamanian's very confusing. And one time I went back to the storage room, where there were lots of papers from previous teachers uh, and, and uh, essays. And uh, the, that, that teacher, every time a student wrote down the Chamorro people this, they cross it out and put Guamanian. <laughs> so, you know, that, just that kind of switch between Guamanian and Chamorro uh, was an indicator of some kind of, of shifting, of shifting. So that, and, and all of that is just a reflection of identity. Uh, but, you know, so Guahu Tautotano was not a pageant about Guamanians. 
uh, and it wasn't a Guamanian uh, trick. It wasn't a Guamanian art show. It was an effort to uh, tap into something that I think uh, Uncle Carlos knew was there all along. Uh, it's amazing. Mm, I'm getting golf bonito to now. And so let me, um, I wanted to share because now, uh, nowadays, looking back, we can say, of course, that this was such an important, pivotal moment. But, you know, other than people who were affected in the audience, was there criticism in the in the wider community? Or how was the play sort of uh, received? How was this received? I mean, uh, for example, in the PDN, they said Chamorro pageant draws mixed reviews. <laughs> <laughs> Has a... Uh, yeah, well, yeah, you know, but that's a typical uh, journalism report, you know. A journalist mm. always has to say there's two sides to everything, even though 90% of the people are on one side, 10%. You're in a debate, you know, and you wipe out the other person, the news report will be, uh, both sides did well, they, you know, articulated. So that, that's kind of, but, but yeah, so what the argument was then, you know, was that uh, one was this was sort of artificial uh, and uh, that, that was prominent. And the other, the other argument was bloodline. So the, the other argument was the, the demographics of, uh, of your bloodline. So a lot of people spent their time uh, uh, talking about this. And, uh, you know, that uh, basically you're talking about uh, half-breeds, uh, 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 you know, th this was like, uh, like for me, uh, people, I used to say, uh, the people who were, you know, not too happy with all the kind of wild commentary I was making on a lot of different things at the time would say, well, you know, Underwood is, 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 is suffering from uh, some kind of cultural uh, conflict that he's uh, trying to uh, prove his legitimacy by doing this. And I, I, I just, I don't know. I never, I never felt that. I didn't, I didn't know that I wasn't a whole person. I didn't know that I was suffering some kind of internal cultural conflict. I didn't feel that. I just felt like I was just telling people who I was. But that was the way they did it, and the way they delegitimized it was the, uh, was the, the, the focus on bloodline. And uh, I had a really strong uh, exchange with a professor. A philosophy. It was very, uh, very uh, Dr. James Newby, and he was a philosophy a professor at the University of Guam, and uh, he 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 would spend time on analyzing bloodline and identity and all that, and and he would try to uh, de de not delegitimize, but sort of throw cold water on this whole Chamorro movement by saying that most of the time these people were, you know, demographically or uh, bloodline infirmed. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what exactly how to put it, but, you know, you didn't have sufficient blood. And so I, 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 I sort of flipped the script on him, you know, and I used the bloodline argument uh, from a different way. I said it's the, 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 the most common perception of American racists is to say that one drop of blood makes you black. But in the case when, uh, you know, so African-Americans were restricted from doing things. So you have to define African-Americans and the different states define that. If you had one great grandparent who was black, you were all black. Didn't matter what the other great grandparents were. So I said, how is it that uh, no amount of blood, uh, white blood would make you white? in American society and, you know, and no, no, no amount of tomorrow blood, even if it was just a little bit, would ever make you tomorrow. So I tried to flip that script on him. And, uh, you know, we had a sort of a debate, if you would. And, you know, at the end, he conceded it. And that was, that was a great, great, uh, I felt a great deal of satisfaction from that conversation because we kind of overcame that argument. And he just said, well, you know, I said, yeah, you know, uh, Jim, it's all socially constructed by whoever is in power. I said, so that's that's the problem. And uh, so people know who they are. Uh, there's no pure blood anything anywhere in the whole world. If you mm. 
want it to be pure blood and you go back 300 years, you have a potential, you know, 60,000 uh, progenitors. How in the hell? Are, <laughs> what, what possible world do we live in where you have a possible 60,000 progenitors uh, all being of the same uh, group of people consistently? It just doesn't mm -hmm. happen. No, uh, thank you for bringing that up, though, because I think um, I always uh, it's uh, because the, the nature of the conversation has shifted. So a lot of people, you know, a, a tomorrow does not have to go as far to assert their existence as they used to. I mean, there's yeah. still there's still issues. There's still contentions. I mean, sort of the, the half breed, uh, half blood mix mestizo argument. I still get that all the time. I'm trying to remember what his what his name is. There's some guy who used to be on the, oh, a white dude, he used to be on the education policy board. Oh, Barry Mead. So every yeah. time he doesn't, every time he doesn't like something that I say, he comments on Facebook and says, well, you're not even really tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. No, so what are and you? Are, that, in, in, that context, <laughs> in that context, neither are his children. <laughs> That's what I don't get, you know? Why, why? <laughs> Why would what what does he what is he thinking? You know, how does what does he call his children? Does he tell his children, you're not really tomorrow. <laughs> you know, it's it's a, it's a it's a really um but but it's it's something that's uh, with us. Uh and and of course the term Guamanian, and I think finally the US census is actually going to <clears throat> officially bury the term Guamanian in the 2030 census. Because in the 2020 census, in the in the 50 state census, I, not so on the Guam census, but in the 50 the 50 state census, you could uh, still list Guamanian as your ethnic group. So there were 24,000 Guamanians uh, in living in the states in 2020. Uh, but you know, come 2030, they're going to have to make a choice. I don't know what the choice is. The choice will be tomorrow. <laughs> So, so that that uh, the use of the term Guamanian in that context is uh, is uh, is was meant to delegitimize. Although in the beginning, after World War II, the use of the term Guamanian was meant to indicate a kind of a progressive uh, Chamorro. You know, mm -hmm. this was the new breed of Chamorro, Chamorro coming out of the war experience, ready to engage the world, ready to engage a modern world. So these are Guamanians, and mm. but nobody didn't think that that meant that Filipinos were Guamanians or statesiders were Guamanians. They understood that Guamanians were were the Chamorros, but then of course over time that uh, shifted. Oh man, it is such an interesting history just the, of that term itself. Um, now, for those of you watching, if you have any questions, put for but pegagi comments message me or put in the comments. We've already got a few questions that have come in, but if you have any questions about Guahu Tautotano, its origin, but also just per, you know, Underwood as, uh, Dr. Underwood here as somebody who has been involved in these issues for, for a while now, been at the center of a lot of them and, um, you know, has, has lots of anecdotes, wonderful anecdotes and plenty of great things that you can quote in your thesis or dissertation. And so one question that we have that I wanted to get to real fast. So when you, for the first performance, it was on Naval Station. And yeah. so somebody wants to know, why was it at Naval Station? Or is um, there it, any reason it was there? Yeah, instead there of was, yeah, there was no auditorium anywhere on the island at the time that, could, that you know, where you could go that was uh, air conditioned, where the air conditioner worked and... Uh, and and uh, so the the UOG Fine Arts would have been uh, too small, so that was uh, it's, a, it's a technical uh, it's a mechanical reason. There was no reason for it other, and you know hotel ballrooms weren't equipped for that. And uh, so I don't know. Maybe uh, you know I don't know. The MWR ran. Uh, I'm sure MWR on uh, military facilities uh, made money on it. So. We had to buy their popcorn, <laughs> but it was good. Yeah, yeah and so I, uh, looking at this too. Uh, hold on one second. Johnny Sablon and Flora Bazaquan were also involved in this. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, they were they were the singers. So, you know, they were the in a sense the stars. Mm. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> you know, it's like when you uh it's interesting, okay? Like they were the stars because they sang the songs and uh, they weren't involved in the Tano part as much as they were singing ballads in the the second half of the show. And uh, uh, but they were obvi the obvious talent of the show, the, the most well known talent at the time. And uh, you know, there was a discussion. Uh, uh, you know, if you ever go like uh, like you ever see a play on Broadway, they have playbill. Uh, you ever see? You know, it's like a, a standard publication. It tells you when you open the playbill, it doesn't tell you who the scriptwriter is. Doesn't tell you who the producer is. It tells you who the stars are. <laughs> so there was discussion about how to format this program. Who should go in the front? <laughs> <laughs> so as you can tell in this program, since my picture isn't even in the program, I wasn't involved in that conversation very much. <laughs> so this program, this program is fascinating. Somebody could really do a deep <laughs> analysis of this because it it has, of course, Carlos Titano honoring him, and then it has Marco Polo tours, <laughs> and then it has the page with Flora Bosa and the stars, <laughs> and Est and Tan Esta Huffer, <laughs> Tan Estet Huffer, and then and then it goes into other stuff, but uh, more ads, and there's I Primo Mono si Linda, <laughs> yeah, and then Hagen uh, Uncle Cutler's name, yeah, Good. <laughs> nice picture, and then, <laughs> and then more, and then. The dancers and uh, and then I love this one. It has Johnny Sablon again, and <laughs> Flores Lukwe, and uh -huh. how how goes si Senor Odo not available? <laughs> <laughs> I just had such a minor role in it that my picture didn't they didn't bother hounding me for my picture. <laughs> but it's okay, you know. I mean, uh, it's not like uh, uh but but uh, th these individuals did work hard because it was a ma uh, production. And so, you know, I would be asked periodically to come in and kind of have conversations with people to kind of uh, set their uh, uh, perspective uh, on it, you know. So, yeah, yeah. so that's, uh, so, uh, so, but look at some of these people have gone on to, uh, you know, bigger and better things. There's Jesse Rivera and uh, the Sands. I think, uh, I don't know whether that's for Una Sands' uncle or her father. And Itatanya, Hungan, Itatanya. This yeah. is a. And then uh, there's, uh, of course, there's uh, Ike Santos and his brother Joe Santos. And then there's Rick Baza, who's uh, Juan Baza's son. And, uh, you know, James Munia, you know, so. The whole gang was there. Uh, and the same thing with uh, the women. I don't know why they put them next. You know? But you had, uh, you know, Vanjie Desson, famous uh, coral reef activist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you had these others, uh, you know. Oh, again, this is. Yeah. And so, uh, okay, so we have another question that has come in. And it goes to what you were mentioning earlier about the issue of um, Chamorro, Austronesian Chamorro words, and then Spanish Chamorro words. Yeah. And so what was that process like for you? Um, just because um, sort of, uh, I know, uh, I know that I often encounter people who, who feel very strongly that politically in terms of their learning Chamorro, they only want to learn the Austronesian Chamorro words. <laughs> sometimes can't tell the difference and then they will say, you know, they will assume that a word that is important is, is Austronesian in its origin, but it's actually Spanish in its origin. And so um, what was that process like? Because I think um, one, one thing that we've seen and that you've talked about is a shift is that a hundred years ago, if a Chamorro wanted to sound better, they would use the fancy Spanish words and less of the Austronesian words. And yeah. that would up currency. That's amongst right. other but now amongst, yeah it, was, it promoted you socially 
Hungan. But now, yeah, yeah, Friday, so, that's not... right. And so what was that like, sort of that experience? Because this might have been one of the first times that there was Chamorros who were really trying to 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 divide things up, like in a very yeah. Con yeah. So some people thought that uh, the objective was to purge Spanish words, which is not the objective. <laughs> the objective was not to purge uh, Spanish words. The objective was to write chants that didn't have Spanish words. That's the you know because obviously they wouldn't uh, be uh, using those words. So that was uh, so. The first word to uh, go by the wayside was tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow itself couldn't be used in any of the chants. That's the, one of the great ironies. And you know, hey, nothing is perfectly uh, consistent. But uh, so, but for me, it was uh, pretty simple actually. Uh, you know, because I I had a, especially at that time, of course. That was 40 years ago. Now my Spanish is, I, I don't use it, so uh, it's sort of atrophied, but I can still read it. So, uh, you know, it's, um, it was a simple process. But for, for many, many really, uh, I, and I have to take this as a serious uh, uh, matter. Most Chamorro speakers in 1980, and there were, you know, literally thousands and thousands of them, very accomplished Chamorro speakers, really could not tell the difference between a Spanish word and a Chamorro word. They just assumed it to be an integrated whole. And so that was pretty clear. Uh, so they, nobody, uh, no, when people say, oh, that's a Spanish word, they go, really? I, well, I don't know. Maybe it could be, you know. So that, there's that. And so I was brought in as part of my task at that Uncle Carlos, maybe it was just, uh, trying to sell me on the whole project as <laughs> part of my task was we're going to write chants and you're going to tell people that you can't use these words. <laughs> I said, okay, we'll give it a shot. So we wrote chants, you know, so that, that was basically it. Uh, but he, he was the, you know, he, he the, the first was hita, hita ni mantoto to, no, you know, that really just came from him. Uh, he, he would say, this is, the kind of thing that I wanted. So, and so then based on that, we added other verses and things like that. Hitaniman met good tauto. You know, we wouldn't say hitaniman but barun tauto. You see, so but barun is a Spanish word. Now, for people, tomorrow speakers at that time, I don't think but barun was seen as a Spanish word. Um, mm -hmm. It was just a tomorrow word. If people say but barun, you say matakna but barun. Mit good, no, in Bilikeru, you know. Uh, so yeah. they, th those those were all in the context of Chamorro speaking with an integrated whole. So people who allegedly speak mixed languages don't see mixed languages. <laughs> they just see a language. And so it's important to understand. It's like people who are mixed blood don't see themselves as mixed up. They just see themselves as a person. And so that's that's the same thing with language. So you know, if you had uh, some kind of um, uh, experience with it, uh, then. But there were others who could easily do that. There are lots of uh, Spanish-speaking uh, Chamorros who could easily uh, find that, but they didn't give it the time and effort that mm -hmm. I had given it. You know, and so the irony was, uh, you know, I was a curriculum writer for the uh, a bilingual program. And they tried to get me to, uh, there, there was a book that was uh, written in Spanish, a children's book, and they wanted me to translate it into uh, English, I mean, into Chamorro. And even though Chamorro and Spanish has a connection, I couldn't do it. I had to first translate the book from Spanish into English, and then from English into Chamorro. So even though the, the connection of vocabulary and some structural connection between Spanish and Chamorro, I couldn't do that. It just, it didn't fit. It was not in my personal psychology. But so now, of course, the, the test of authenticity is, you know, do we want to purge words? Do we want to purge words? Do we want to... Uh, 
you know, so the standard would, would be um, um, uh, my father would like to point this out. Uh, he would say, Padre Roman de Vera would like to, to when he gave sermons, uh, he wanted to use uh, as much tomorrow as possible and he consciously avoided Spanish. So he would never say, uh, uh, at that time, he would say, <laughs> okay. so and that was a conscious decision made by Padre Roman. And of course, my father, you know, caught on to it. But I think most people just said, well, it's just a word choice. Mm. You know, why, why would he do that? Do you say sakan or anus? You know, mm -hmm. that those are those are choices you can make, but they're both comprehensible. But you mm -hmm. can't make choices between things that are incomprehensible. That's my that's the, the, the thing then. I try to caution people. Well, if you're making a choice between something we know and are familiar with and something we don't know, well, I, that's not a choice. Mm -hmm. You have to go with what you know. Again. But that 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 conversation is alive to some people because it in a in a way it's satisfying to uh, a pursuit of uh, you know authentic the, the the pursuit of authenticity is satisfying but inevitably it's it's not going to find uh, it's never going to be fully satisfying no it's 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 very true i that's why i think um you know i always like to I always like to encourage bringing back of some older words, or if you want to use sort of this word instead of that word, that's fine. But what I love is sort of the the fact, you know, in the same way. And and what what I find always really fascinating, because you were talking about this in terms of blood, bloodlines and blood purity. But the the criticisms that people make of Chamorro, where all of the words for education and government and professional things, technical things are all Spanish. It's the same argument you can make about English. <laughs> that it's, oh, oh, it's thing for the government. Well, it's probably Greek or it's Latin in origin. <laughs> yeah. It's, if it, oh, it's, it's a the way it is. Yeah. And so the thing then is that this perspective that we have about authenticity, authenticity is always really interesting because a lot of times when we feel when when authenticity is used negatively, it's used to kind of to to kind of take the person who is speaking of the authenticity issue out of the discussion that like, oh, you people don't have a, your own language or, oh, you yeah. people don't exist anymore. That's and right. so and so that's why uh, for me, it's kind of like, no, don't don't you don't want to purge the spanish because if you wanted to be kind of radical and get back against quiroga or magellan or whatever even though he was portuguese then uh, what you should do is <laughs> you should just make the spanish lower class in your language <laughs> so make it <laughs> words are higher in value you know so that if you're speaking to an esteemed elder you use more austronesian words and when you're just kind of talking to your friends and just or just casually, then just use the Spanish words. Then why not? Why not do that instead? But don't don't try to get rid of the Spanish because so many people use it and rely on it. And but make it mean something different to yourself if you want to make well, that point. And 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 you should you when you can make choices, but when you have no choice, like what are we going to say for you know? Well, what 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 am we gonna come up with for politica? You know yeah. what 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 are we gonna spend our our you know uh, good time uh, trying to come up with an alternative for politica when you know maybe we should just spend more time teaching people who don't know politica what politica means, <laughs> and yeah. so so some some are like like a trafniak. A trafniak is an archaic. Austronesian term meaning clan, so same bloodline. Well, I'm I'm for reviving that. It's sort of easy to understand. It's under it's achafanyago, so you can see the origin of it. We come mm -hmm. from the same birth, achafanyago, achafnyat. 
Uh, a woman who gives a lot of birth is hafnyak, hafpanyago. So you can see the, the formation of the word. Uh, a word that I, I'm trying to figure out where it comes from, but it's now being used, is mangafa, for yeah. family, for a nuclear family. Now, I know that the people who use it read it in Frechene, so therefore, <laughs> therefore it's an archaic term. But yeah, but I don't get it. I don't, I don't understand where it comes from. I don't understand its formation. I can't see it. And now all of a sudden, it's even appearing in, in uh, legislation. They have the Manghafa assistance bill. And I'm thinking, wow, I don't know. You know, okay. maybe a, a, a Chafnik would work better, but uh, Manghafa, I don't know. So that's that's the, the kind of, uh, but of course, you know, uh, people are energized and and I, I like the energy. I, I like the energy and, and I don't I don't discount it, but I just don't, uh, you know, it's like, uh, it's like, uh, my mother, my mother always used to emphasize that you're, the whole the whole point of you talking to people is cosa che si chiama comprendiho, mm. comprendizon, co comprendizon isti, is it understandable? Not is it obscure, not is it impressive, not is it you know, uh, you know, but uh, so like uh, you know. Uh, uh, my my father, uh, he loved this uh, when I was little. He, he asked, he goes, how do you say, give this uh, Spaniard a cup of coffee in Chamorro? And so it was pretty obvious to me. Nae isti espanol un tasan cafe. And he would say, that's it. Nae isti itautologo un charetan hanum maipi. <laughs> which is a more, you know, the Tareta is up for conversation. I don't know whether that, I doubt that that's Austronesian, but it was seen as Austro, more Austronesian than Tasha. So, uh, so that, that uh, you know, he, he just did that to emphasize, I guess maybe that's, maybe he implanted that in my mind <laughs> through that, through that game. Maybe he did, that I started noticing things and asking questions about, well, is that really it? old word or you know maybe he did that through that game but uh, yeah that's so you know I knew early on uh, uh, Totologo, Gilago, Galogo I knew all of these terms uh, uh, were really like about the Spaniards the animals that the Spaniards brought so uh, and and he 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 taught that to me so I was sort of understanding that uh, now I don't know you know, I'm just grateful that I didn't have the other, maybe the conversations of my contemporaries were different, more like, you know, something, something more ordinary like that. Whereas we didn't have pigs to feed, so my father instead played word games. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, Sidus Masi put it out, because I think it shows uh, for, because for many people who really want to research and dig into the language and understand it. I think one of the things that we should always remember is that we can theorize, we can speculate, and it can be very fun to do that. But then you also have to accept that some things we we may not know, because even the studies of every major language in the world, at a certain point, people are just guessing. And they and there's some guesses that are better guesses than others. Um, you know, because people, some people used to believe that all the languages came from the Tower of, of Babel, and stuff like that. And so you can you can guess, but I think one of the things that I like about what you're suggesting there, though, is that there are those kind of theories that come simply because you you want it to mean something, but those that come because there's a little bit more support, right? The difference between uh, Atzafnak and then Mangafa, right? Like you were saying there is that Atzafnak is something where if you speak tomorrow, you know, then you can understand, even if you've never heard it before, you can guess as to what it might mean, because you heard, as you said, hafnak, you've heard other terms that share a similarity, right? And that's that's a key thing, right? The use of logu as well, is that if you hear logu in this context and multiple contexts, it provides evidence for some from center of potential meaning there. But mangafa is a harder one, because mangafa is one in which 
you can guess. Like I hear people saying, oh, it, it means just Menhafa, the what's. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, that's interesting now. But <laughs> is there something that we can connect that to? Is it part of something? Because as you pointed out, when you're talking about relations, at least the Freysene account shows that atza, atza is a key word that is used in that to make that we're the same, we're connected to something. So what is it in Mangafa that would make it different than other terms? Well, I, I can tell you one use of atza, which is used in contemporary with atraguma, which becomes atrakma. <laughs> So, so you know, you can see, like, I'm shacking up, literally. I'm shacking up. We're living in the same house. So, a, a, a chaguma becomes a chakma. But, you know, may, maybe that was had a different meaning in those days. I don't know. But you can see the linguistic process that is at work. So, if you wanted to, to understand the origin of the word a chakma, there it is. A cha plus guma. So, you know, so then, it, and, and any kind of like uh, Chamorro speaker would instantly see that. Whereas uh, some Chamorro speakers or some people who don't really know Chamorro that well would, would never really uh, kind of grasp that. So, yeah, there's that. And then there, there's the understanding that even though, you know, words last a long time and phrases sometimes last as long, uh, it's pretty obvious there's been uh, enormous changes. I mean, you're talking about thousands of years. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly confident, although I've been challenged on this, I'm fairly confident that if I went back to the 1600s, that I could have a conversation with Matapang and Hura. Uh, maybe, you know, it'd be really hard, uh, but, you know, uh, maybe after a couple of months, it'll become a whole lot easier. But uh, that's that's now. Now, if you take me back to you know the original people who landed in Litek, <laughs> Punta and Pouna, I don't know. All bets are off. I just I'm not sure. You know, I'm just not You're, sure. <laughs> the only thing I'm able to say is road to the moon, <laughs> Hulan, <laughs> and it yeah, maybe that, it just. <laughs> In Lima, you can say Lima, Lima, Lima. <laughs> Lima. Well, yeah, there you go. Everybody <laughs> loves the number five. So the, 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 that, but you know, if you're able to have this kind of conversation, partially in jest, but partially in understanding who you are, you become stronger, not weaker. You become more authentic, not less authentic. And I, that's why I'm uh, sometimes a little bit, uh, you know, uh, not disturbed, but just kind of uh, uh, amazed that uh, the level of effort that some people exert in this. And of course, you know, theorizing uh, things are, it's, uh, it's, an, it's a normal human enterprise. And if you're willing to theorize, then you should be willing to justify and to be subjected to criticism. Mm. No, we're almost out of time, but we do have a few uh, questions. And so uh, Polly Suba wants to know, um, how was, do you know how Pa'atautautano was received though when it was performed at FESPAC? Sort of uh, when, uh, I know that there was issues, it, it wasn't performed in New Caledonia, right? Like it was, or wait, wait, I'm trying to remember. Well, there the original some... performance, the original presentation of tomorrow. Uh, dance was, you know, the dances that we normally thought of and growing up for me, you know, uh, Bailan Palito, Bailan Haiguas, you know, kind of, you know, a uh, little bit of cha-cha be beating the little sticks and, uh, you know, those were the dances that were presented. And of course, they're heavily influenced uh, from the, uh, the, uh, the 19th century uh, uh, Hispanic world. Let's just put it that way. So, uh, after experiencing that uh, uh, sort of humiliation, you know, the the people who were going to present it next wanted to present something more authentic, or quote more authentic or more reflective of a, of a long tradition. So the Guaho Tautano, Pa Tautano, then became the presentation. But even that was, you know, blended. 
So it's pretty obvious that these are all blended themes. And, you know, whether you want to include, so for me, when now the way that it's framed is that there's Spanish dances and Chamorro dances. I don't think of those dances as Spanish dances. I just think of those as Chamorro dances from a different time period. And so, uh, you know, uh, now people want to say, I don't want to do that dance because that's Spanish. Well, you know, that's how your great grandparents dance. What are you going to do? You're going to deny your great grandparents. What, what, what is the point of that? What's the objective of that? You know, it's like uh, if uh, Filipinos and uh, Mexicans said, I don't want to do that dance because that came, was influenced by the Spaniards. Well, you know, mandolins away and swaying and dancing that way. It's all kind of endemic part of uh, Filipino and Mexican folk culture. Mm. No, that's a, uh, it, it's interesting because, you know, thinking today, uh, it's, it's an interesting sort of gap in the identity that many Chamorros who feel sort of strong about their identity, they have sort of this resistance, of course, to, it's a, it's a critique of Spanish colonialism, right? But it's like, a, but, but it's always so interesting because for me, it's like the most Chamorro dance that I can think of from when I was growing up is the electric slide because every, every, every a woman that I knew really liked the, the the electric slide and they would dance it for I remember going to some family parties and then the DJ would turn off the electric slide and some old Chamorro lady would go back and tell them to turn it back on and then uh, they wanted to keep dancing and so but the thing is that so you know and I think for a lot of Chamorros today like they will think of things like bingo those things as being very Chamorro in like a contemporary cultural context, but then because of sort of this end in a, and we've talked about it. And then uh, just in terms of this, it's almost black legend sort of derived sort of resistance to the Spanish presence that kind of comes out later, sort of that's this bad thing, but it wasn't necessarily bad for Chamorros back then. It was just kind of who they were. Mm -hmm. They enjoyed, they were part of the empire. It didn't mean that they did not have their own distinct identity within that empire. So that's one thing that I think people miss is that the Chamorros accepting their place in the Spanish empire in a certain sense doesn't mean that they completely give up. And in fact, it actually probably led that to them developing the national consciousness, which then Guahu Tautotanu played upon as being like this... Yeah, I mean, uh, and, and of course, what, what the uh, Filipinos have and what Mexicans have is they have a country. <laughs> they have a nation. They, they completed their national project. So they're able to uh, portray themselves as a developing nation. And so the, the Spanish imprint in that is an addition to their development, not a distraction or not a degradation. So, you know, if you go to uh, Mexican national identity, it's not going to spend their time trying to revive, uh, you know, dances from the Mesoamericans and the Nahua or the, you know, Yaqui Indians or any of that. Although those dances have been recorded and they know how to do them. So, uh, but the Mexican national identity is going to include that. They're going to, you know, do the mariachi hats. They're going to wear the serape. They're going to dance around and they're going to, you know, twirl their dresses and they're going to do all of that. And the same thing with Filipinos. And they're not going to, no one's going to say, oh, you can't do that because that's from the Spanish. Uh, my gosh, you know, people would say, what are you talking about? This is who we are. And so I think Chamorros had reached that point. But of course, now uh, there's some uh, reservation on that. I, I just, I, I think it's a, it's a misplaced. I think it's a pageant. That's what it is. It's a pageant. It's it's who 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 we are, who we became, and who we are today in combination. So, and I don't I don't I, you know, but uh, there's some people. Well, you know, there's always that those voices as well. So you had the uh, uh, started off by talking about the Chamorro affirmation and the Chamorro denial. That was the kind of the context for the social conversation in the seventies. So what's the social conversation in the 2020s? Is that uh, is it uh, tomorrow uh, affirmation uh, 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 and tomorrow authenticity? 
uh, versus, you know, tomorrow inauthenticity. You know, that's that conversation has, has shaped, been shaped a little bit differently. And so we see that manifested in, and there are people going to come along and they're going to think deeper things and they're going to be introspective about it. And, and they're going to do, you know, things that are going to tickle their minds. And, and I'm, I'm all for that. Mm, no, Sidhu Smasin. Oh, to, and then dispense it through because we, we, we got a lot of, a lot more questions towards the end. Sure. So, Polly, to your to your question though, so I believe it was originally supposed to be performed at Festpac in New Caledonia, but I think because of uh, unrest in the in the in in New Caledonia, it was moved the following year Festpac to Tahiti, where it was performed in Tahiti in 1985. Um, so I think that's one of the issues there because the 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 articles in '84 say it's going to be in New Caledonia, but then. It was performed the following year at Festpac in '85, um, and then oh, okay, wait. See, si Senor No Kirigua, no, he wants to know, just real quickly. Sangani, I'm happy. Magai tining up mo pa di balam batudzan na instrument, and so happy tining up mo. What are what are your thoughts on the batudzan? Okay. Uh, clearly, it's an instrument designed in Gua, in Guam in the Marianas. I'm sorry, Noel. I know that you want to talk to no, Jana B. No, it's a it's an instrument design here. Lo, uh, it's played against lo. Belembo is clearly a word from uh, a Sp- a Spanish and Portuguese. So, uh, belembo is uh, belembo too. Then you play it up against your your tummy. Uh, it's a stringed instrument, and so it's one of those things that I think comes out of that. Now. Did they have a similar instrument in uh, before the arrival of Europeans? I don't know. I, I may, they may have. I, I just I, 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 I've never heard anything referred to it that way. So no, Sidus Sidus Masi Nuham Nuham Zutoros. Thank you for all your questions. I'm so sorry that we didn't get to all of them. Uh, but Senor, do you want to offer any sort of uh, concluding thoughts, kind of reflecting back on Guahu Tautautanu? Yeah, well, first of all, let's make sure that when people explain the Belen Bautudran, that it's pressed against your stomach, not like you lay down on the floor and you play it in a prostate manner, which I've also seen portrayed. And I keep wondering, who, who would play a musical instrument that way, you know? Uh, that the Guahu Tano unearth all of that, those sentiments, because the search for identity is powerful amongst human beings. And so this gave us a glimpse into, uh, into a continuing saga and uh, the saga of a, of a really great people. And so I'm so glad that that happened. I'm grateful for all the people who participated in it. Uh, the, all the Chamorros and all the Filipinos <laughs> who participated in it as well, because they were really kind of prominent in the, you know, in the formation of it and the dancing and all that. But of course, the vision of uh, Carlos Taitano was, uh, uh, Tun Cutlos was uh, very prominent in that. Guahu Tano is the affirmation of the continuity of a great people. It should not be a source of division. It should be a source of pride. And it should be inspiration to future generations to continue to find their way in a world that is generally not friendly to the continuance of the Chamorro people. Sidus Masi, Senor, Sidus Masi, Hungan, I who agradeced in I know, Sumana Hanguini guest in a podcast. I appreciate that so much. And Sidus Masino Hamzu Todus, New Mega Purume Ekungo, Kesti Finapuest in episode Fanatsu, Ajos, Mr. Kio True, Manat Lee. Thank you, Manat Lee Talon.